so that we have a record. Uh, and we're going to tie the first fly I'm going to do is this guy here, which I ca is called a red tag for obvious reasons. It's got a red tail. Um, and what I might do here is uh, doo -doo -doo. I might see if I can spotlight me, uh, if I can figure out how to do that. Oh, I can't seem to figure out how to do that. I'm playing with a new iPad, so you'll have to bear with me for a while. There we are. There we go. So you're gonna to get to see me and nothing but me unless you wanna chat, you'll see in the bottom corner. Uh, I'm Like I say, I'm playing with a new iPad, so I can actually see virtually everybody when I'm off spotlight. Um, anyway, so the, the hook on this guy is, uh, is a TMCO, sorry, I must add, it's a 9671, which means it's a, a 1X long wet fly hook with a down eye. And it's, uh, this one is a number 10, because this is a relatively short and compact fly. Uh, thread is uh, just a standard dot black. Uh, gee, this is stiff today. For some reason, my bobbin is stiff. There we go. I'm going to start right behind the eye and get going back on the, on the hook. Um, find my scissors. I think I'm going to have to. There you go. Just my thread tension to start with and the vise. A little bit tighter hole here. There we go. So once I get the thread on, I'm just going to wrap in uh, touching turns all the way back on the hook shank to the barb of the hook. One of the tricks here is <clears throat> when you get past the, the point of the hook, you want to make sure that the tip of the bobbin as it goes over top of the hook is behind where the thread touches and in front of the point when you go by the front. Otherwise you'll nick the thread and you'll end up with it in your lap. I'm just gonna stop right where the barb used to be. And the tag is, is simply red wool, nothing really fancy. I'm gonna do a little pinch wrap here, which means I'm going to grab it between my thumb and forefinger with a couple of millimeters sticking out. I'm going to set that V in between my thumb and my forefinger right over top of where the thread is hanging. And I'll bring the thread up between my thumb and forefinger and push it to the back so that it's pinned between my thumb and forefinger. I'm going to take it down the far side of the hook and ring it around so it misses the barb. And I'm not gonna pull down, I'm gonna come around and up in between my fingers again, and I'm gonna pull up. And then I'm gonna do that again, around the point and up the top. Then I can use the tip of my finger to hold that material on the hook while I wrap forward and tie down the excess. I'm not gonna trim that off. The tail needs to be about a gap length long, like the width of the gap. And I'm gonna just cut it a little bit there. So that's the tag. The other material for this guy is <coughs> chenille. And as Florin mentioned earlier, you can use a whole raft of different colors. For this one, I happen to have an interesting black chenille it has a little sparkle in it. You can see it's a little bit sparkly. To avoid having a great big bump at the back of the hook, the first thing I do to prepare this is I use my thumb nail and fingernail at the front end of the, at the edge, and I pull some of the fuzz out so you get these little taggy bits that stick out. 
And I'm going to lay those down so the, tag, the, the, the thread bits are on the near side of the hook, right where I had tied the tag in. And I'm going to wrap over, I wrap over top of that all. And that because it's used those, uh, the little thread bits, the first wrap is going to be a little bit of thread and then it's going to start with uh, the chenille. Bring my thread forward to about the same distance behind the eye as the eye diameter. Make this easier, just got cut off that. Now for those who have really short bits or if you wanna keep your fingers out of the way, we can take our hackle pliers and use the hackle pliers to wrap the chenille around the hook. Again, I have to pull it around the front of the hook point so it doesn't get me. And use touching turns all the way up the hook shank. And by touching turns, I mean the material touches but doesn't overlap itself on the way up the hook. So you end up with a nice even fuzzy body with no gaps in between. When I get to the front, I wrap, I hold the hackle pliers up with my right hand so that I create this V here, then use my left hand to put the thread through that V right where it touches the hook. And do that two or three times. That ties the material onto the hook securely. Take the hackle plier swap hands and pull back and wrap right tight in front of where it's sticking up. And that's called locking in the material because the, the little thread core is now bent up it's not gonna unravel on me when I clip off the excess. And like always, when we're cutting anything off on the hook, we bring our scissors in from the top down and lay it on top of the hook and then cut. That keeps the inadvertent cutting of the thread and ending up with your bobbin on the floor. Dave, one one more thing, you know, when you're when you're doing this for a, for an absolute beginner, yep. this is the point where you you know when you're tying this off, remind your student that leaving two um, eye lengths of space oh. on the shank is is vital. I mean, you do it instinctively, so you don't yes. even think about yeah. it. At least one eye width, because and when you tie the the fuzz off, yeah, a little more than one eye width. That'll little... lead up another eye length. So I yeah. I try to leave two because I know I'll end up with one. That's right. You end up crowding them. <laughs> so then the hackle. This hackle is is a hand hackle, and for those who have not used hen before, I they're cheap. Like I remember when I bought this, it was this particular hen. It was like eight bucks it's cheap and there's a gazillion feathers i have a box full of colored hen hackles and they all have a little they go from blonde to black and and they have a lot of interesting features in them they're short and they're soft shanked so you can use them for a whole raft of things uh, hackles being one but you can use them for wing material. There's all sorts of things you can use these. And the reason I started using them is that these were the flies that the Kiwis used for what they called the killer style flies, with the, particularly the ones with this little bar down the middle. Uh, so I've started using those more and more as, as wet fly apples. Now the trick is to prepare this, is to take the fluffy bit at the end that, that's really soft and fuzzy, and hold, hold the stem with your right hand and gently peel the fluff off the back. You don't wanna work too hard on that or it will maybe pull a stem off. So you have to play a bit with it. And all that does is that gets the fluff out of the way so that when I start wrapping this hackle, the fluff isn't in the way when I'm wrapping. So it's, that's the first bit. The second thing you want to do is prepare the hackle because I'm going to tie it in by the tip. And the reason for that is I want 
the longer fibers at the back end of this hackle. And I'm not gonna need many of them. Um, you can see that's a little bit more than a, a, a gap width. And I just stroke them back gently. So they point to the butt end of the feather stem. And I leave the tip the way it is. And I'm gonna tie the thing in right where that gap is between these ones and the tip of the hackle. I'm gonna turn it so that you'll see that there's a brightly colored side or a darkly colored side and a sort of a dull side. I want to tie it in so that that brightly color side is facing me. And then I'm gonna I lay it on the hook on the near side of the shank so that that V is right where the thread is hanging. Wrap the thread over once, twice. And then I'm gonna take the tip, I'm gonna pull it up and back, and I'm going to wrap in front of it three times. You'll see that tip sticks straight up. This again is locking that material in. Carefully take scissors, bring it right down on top, right? Just and hold the other, the back part of the hackle out of the way. Get your finger on top and then just snip that stem. A couple of stray feathers that I can trim out. And make another good turn to make sure, two or three turns to make sure that that's tied down tight. I still want to leave a good almost an eye width behind the eye where I'm letting my thread hang. Once again, take my hackle pliers, grab the stem, and I gently, because this is a fairly delicate hackle, I'm gonna hold it up, wet my fingers, and then stroke these feathers back a little bit. That didn't work. I got some crap in my hackle pliers, there we go. Again, have to be very delicate with this because the stem is thin. Stroke them back and make one turn around. Pick it up, stroke them back again. Make a second turn around. And bring the stem up once again in front of the hook and hold it with my right hand. Put the thread through that V again twice, three times. And if you're using really thick thread, you only may need two wraps, but this is a dot. Two or three wraps in front. And that stem can be trimmed out. Now. Again, take wet my fingers a little bit, make a thumb and two fingers and Stroke that hackle back out of the way from the head of the fly, the eye of the fly. And I can wrap several times around here to make a head of the fly right behind the eye. When I get it so that it's a, I don't want the head too big. It's maybe double the width of the shank of the hook. And then I tie a whip finish. And for, for most, of you, you'll use the, the whip finisher like the Mattarelli. And the trick with this I found is to hold it with the right hand so that it's sloping down, hook the thread, bring the thread up around with the bobbin. And this is the awkward part for a beginner is have enough thread out here to, to get the thread up and around that wiggly part then bring your thread so that it's up at the hook shank and your bobbin is parallel to the hook shank. And let go of the bead and just turn around the eye of the hook using holding on to the tube part so that the whole tool spins. Loosen the tension on the bobbin and push towards the back until the, the web bent part comes out then pull with the bobbin and that will pull the little hooky part up to the eye of the hook. Take it out and that's your whip finish. 
Now, for those who are not good with a whip finisher, I have this stuff, which is you can get at home hardware. It's a brushable super glue. And it, as you take it out, you can see that there's a little brush here. Just be careful not to get glue on the very end here or it will glue the cap back on it. And then I just take about half a centimeter of thread and get some glue on it. And then I'm going to wrap that thread around the shank right behind the eye. And when the glue part is gone, I come in underneath and trim that short. And that's thread tag. Finito. Very simple fly, but it's also an effective fly. Now, if you want a shorter hackle, you need to use a, 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 a partridge or something a little bit shorter. Uh, I, I could probably pull some really short uh, barbules off of that hen if I wanted to, but for the purposes of a, a simple fly, I've left it fairly long. Comments, criticisms, criticism, critique. <laughs> if you want shorter hackle, you can use neck instead of saddle which yep. is what you've been using and if you want to do this in super tiny and you want small hackle that's relatively easy to handle uh starling is a good yeah starling yeah. is a good material and then uh if you have uh whole wings from various ducks and other water birds uh some of the some of the little soft feathers on the underside of wings um, mm -hmm. are typically used as as wet hackles on on smaller right. flies and those tend to be various shades of gray now j just in one in an aside this is a, a partridge it's a fairly long partridge but one of the tricks that you can do too to to make it a little easier to wrap or a, a little more sparse to wrap is when you've done this prep work is to and you've got the, the intensely colored side facing me is to pull off the barbules on the top so now when i wrap it's only half a hackle so i'm going to tie that in that way and then wrap half a hackle so that gives you a nice sparse uh, hackle for those little wee teeny flies. It's a lot trickier to do. You need to have some manual dexterity to get that to work properly. Uh, but it's it's somewhat easier. You get a much more even and sparse hackle around the fly. A lot of those original English wet flies like uh, partridge and green and grouse and orange and stuff like that are tied in that fashion. Dave, what would you yeah. use this fly for and how would you fish it? Uh, I would fish this with a, uh, a sinking line, maybe a type one or a type two sink in the in the surface film or just below the surface film, uh, with a you know a standard leader, uh, and just cast it out and return uh, slowly with a hand twist retrieve. Um, it, it it I think it it uh, represents a lot of things. It, you know some in smaller sizes it could be a midge. It, it could be uh, some small uh, damsels. Uh, it, it, it's it's just a generic buggy fly. Dave, could you please touch on your selection of hooks, <clears throat> up eye, down eye, straight eye, in reference to the knot you use? Ah, okay. Um, I tend to, if I can get them, I tend to use a, a ring eye, the, the 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 straight flat eye because I will tie these using a non-slip loop. And with a non-slip loop, the, the leader goes through like that and it allows the fly to move back and forth like this. With a non-slip with loop with this one, it will move back and forth, but I think it'll also move up and down a little bit. I guess you can adjust 
you, you might try try some up eye and some down eye. Up eyes tend to be used for dry flies because they sit in the surface film better. And ring eyes too. I I like ring eyes for dry flies because they they tend to sit in the surface film much nicer. The down eye ones uh, they tend to cock the fly up a little bit like that on the retrieve. And and. The tighter the knot is to the eye, the more likely it is to cause an up eye to cock down or down eye to cock up. Uh, Timco makes the 200R for wet fly hooks, and I tend to use those a lot for wet flies because they have that, the R is the ring eye. And that's a hook that's sure to make Tony cringe because it's very expensive. And <laughs> it's not just very expensive, it's incredibly hard to come by uh, yeah. whenever I whenever I come across somebody who stocks those and the price is not beyond outrageous I just I stocked up on them so I have a few hundred uh, of the uh, size 10 which is the one I use the most yeah <laughs> that that fly is not dissimilar from the Sula and I've used that in small ponds and brooks with great success yeah, I, it's just generic buggy fly, and, and it's it's a little fatter than the typical English spider fly would be. Like if you tied this with with virtually no tail and just used thread for a body or floss for the body, you're talking the basic original English uh, spider type flies, particularly with the larger hackle. Okay, so that's. That's that guy, that's the red tag. And the reason I, we, I, I teach that early is because the techniques to tie them other than the hack is fairly straightforward. The next simple fly to tie is of course the woolly bugger. And I'm gonna use a, uh, a, a relatively short shank hook, it's a 2X long, it's the same, same basic hook, it's a must add uh, 9671. Uh, 9672 is a 3x long. I'm going to bend the barb down. With this bigger gap, the, this particular vise has a little groove in it that uh, you can fit the bend of the hook in and you can loosen the tension a little bit and it really holds on to that hook. For this, the materials are going to be olive in color. So I'm going to use an olive thread. And I'm, this is going to be a little more than the standard bully bugger, which we, the Northern Lights guys, every time we would attend the uh, boat show or the fishermen, fishing shows, we would set up a table and we would have every little kid that stopped by, we'd sit them down at the table and we would have them tie a woolly bugger. But we had inexpensive materials and not fancy to make it easy for the kids to tie. So we didn't do some of the fancy stuff I'm gonna do for this pattern. So I've got a red bead on this. Uh, red beads and any sorts of bits of color opposite or different from what the main body of the fly is tend to be what we call strike inducers or hot spots. So I put the, uh, the red bead on before I put it in that vise. And this is going to be a little heftier fly. I want it to sink a bit. So I've got some O2O lead-free wire. I'll take a bit of that off. Hold it, the end of it right back on the shank, and then I'm going to wind forward in touching turns, wrapping around the hook shank till I get six or eight or 10, however much I can get on there. And wrap that around and push it right up against the bead. And the purpose of pushing it up against the bead is it's going to hold the bead in place. Firstly, and secondly, it's going to front end 
weight the fly so that when you treat it, it's going to undulate. It's going to go up like this and down like that, up, up and down and up and down as you retrieve it with short strips. So I'm waiting the front end of the fly for that purpose. Once I get that on, I want to make sure that lead or lead free wire isn't going to spin around too much. So I start right behind the bead with my thread, wrap through the wraps of the wire, and that kind of locks it in place so it's not going to spin or slide along the hook shank. Turn it off when I get to the back of the lead wire, lead free wire. I'm going to use my thread here to wrap right behind the, the wire just to build a little bit of a ramp so there's not such a, an abrupt thickness transition between the shank of the hook and the bulk of the wire. So there's a little bit of a, a slope thread wraps there. Now for the tail on this fly is just strung marabou. This is a dark olive. And when I get it out, I'm going to this this stuff is nicer than the stuff that has the really long stems. I don't know where it is a super fly, so I probably bought this in Edmonton. Um, and it's it's strung onto this little bit of material. So all I want out of there is I, I don't want an entire plume. I'm just going to take one of the longer ones here and if I can get it separated from the there we go. So I pull that plume out and I don't want the whole thing. What I'm going to do is I'm just going to use about a, a shank length worth of marabou. Grab the pole plume in my right hand in that separated section with my left hand and pull it off the stem. So I now have a little clump of marabou. I pulled a little bit of stem off with it when I pulled it off. So I'm going to trim the hard bits of stem off that short end. We'll put that right down, right behind where the thread is, and wrap over top of the tip. Wrap that right back down the shank, past the point, right to the bend. And I end up with this material sticking out the back for a tail. Uh, I don't want to cut the marabou. I'm going to cut it shorter. I'm going to make it maybe double gap length in behind. I'm going to wet my fingers and hold them down and use my fingernails of my left hand to break off the excess at the tail end there. So that leaves a little almost fan-shaped tail at the end, and not too long. As with all fly patterns, the stuff that you're going to wrap from the back to the front, the stuff that you wrap forward last is the stuff that you tie in first. Put my marabou away. Moment. And the thing I'm going to wrap forward last is a little bit of gold wire. The purpose of the gold wire is to reinforce the hackle that I'm going to wind forward. So if you're fishing with a, for a toothy critter like a pike, you don't want the tooth of the, or, or a toothy trout, you don't want the tooth of the fish to break the hackle and then it unwinds on you. Hold the wire so that I've got just about uh, three millimeters, three, four millimeters sticking out in front. Again, lay that right down on the near side of the shank, wrap over top of it, and bind it down really good and solid right up to the hook shank. Bring your thread back to the back. And when you do that, push that wire over to the side a little bit, away from you. 
the next thing, last thing goes forward is my hackle. And this is a nice uh, grizzly saddle. Grizzly meaning grizzled. Old guys would get grizzled beers. So this is a grizzly uh, hackle. And when I select one, I'm, I want one that, that has the feathers are, are at least gap length long in the soft part of the hackle down at the bottom. So I'm going to pull one out of the, of the neck. And this guy, because you can wrap it either this way with the butt end tied at the back and round forward, or you can do it the other way, tie it in by the tip and wrap forward to the butt. The difference is, as you can see, this is quite a tapered hackle. So it's longer here than it is there. If you want your fly to have, to be shaped, the hackle to be shaped wide at the back and narrow at the front, you would tie it in by the butt. But I want this thing to create a lot of disturbance when I'm stripping it. So I'm gonna tie it in by the tip first. Once again, I take the tip of the hackle in my right hand, and I'm just gonna stroke back a little bit. So the, a few, a centimeter or so sticks out. And this difference between where it sticks out and where it's still down, that's what I'm gonna lay down on the hook where I tie it in. I'm gonna again wanna do this so that the, the feather you can see is a dull side and an intensely colored side. I want the intensely colored side to face me when I tie it on the hook. I wanna tie it on the near side right where the thread is hanging. And I'm gonna wrap forward on that two or three wraps, wrap forward a little bit, pull the tip up again, and wrap in front of that tip. Again, what this does is again, locks that material in. So when I pull on this hackle, it's not gonna pull out on me and having me start all over. Trimming off on top of the hook again. And then the last thing I tie on, but which is the first thing I want to tie, wind forward, is the chenille. And this is just a simple olive chenille. It's a medium. And I'm going to cut a piece of that just so that I can manage it better. And once again, hold it in my thumb and four fingers with a little bit sticking out. And I'm going to pull the fuzz off of that core thread. The purpose for that is that this is going to give a, a, a much tighter tie-in without creating bulk. Get my thread right back to where that hackle was tied in and the wire. Lay that thread on the near side of the hook, gently wrap over, and then cinch down. Get that wound down really good. Bring my thread all the way up to just about half the beads width behind the bead. Again, you can do this with your fingers if you have good dexterity, but I prefer to do it with my hackle pliers to start with. Again, touching turns just like with the previous fly. I'm gonna wrap nice and smooth wraps up the hook shank. Trying not to leave gaps in between or over wrap from one wrap to the other. The whole idea being to keep a nice even body from back to front. And I'm going to end. Oh, that came undone. <laughs> These things happen. <laughs> I think I have to go back and modify my hackle pliers and put another piece of shrink wrap on them so that they hold material better. There we go. And when I get to where the thread is, I'm gonna hold it down and up. Still wanna leave a little gap in behind the head if I can and wrap 
three times over with it in my right hand. Pull it back. One, two, three. That will do the trick for locking it in. And clean. As I noticed, a lot, a lot of these hackle pliers, they get a little bit worn after a while. So I've got a piece of heat shrink tubing that I have uh, shrunk on one of the legs there that tends to hold the hackle better. Gonna grab the hackle and I'm gonna do the same thing. Now this time I'm not gonna use touching turns. I'm going to spiral the hackle forward. Now, every time you wrap a hackle, it has a tendency to twist in the clockwise direction. So you, every time you wrap, you're probably gonna to have to take that twist out. With, with some hackle pliers, like the, this, this Griffin style, it swivels so it doesn't twist. But with these English hackle pliers, they have a tendency to twist. Again, I wanna space these out reasonably. So I get five or six wraps up the hook. When I get right behind the eye, I'm gonna wrap one right in front of the other, nice and tight to make sort of a fuzzy, bulky front on that thing. Again, holding the right hand and through the V. Left hand in front. I just wanna be careful when I get in here that I'm just gonna get the stem and not the sticky out hackle parts. Now the wire is different because I'm going to wrap the wire around the hook the opposite direction. Instead of going over the top and underneath, I'm gonna go underneath and then over the top. The same open spiral, not touching turns. Every time I, every, while I'm going around here, I want to wiggle the wire a little bit back and forth. And the reason for wiggling the wire and every once in a while I'll brush the, the hackle is that it, you don't want the wire to trap down the barbules that stick out. So as you wiggle, it pushes them out of the way and allows them to continue sticking out. And I only want five or six wraps. And the reason I'm going the opposite direction is as I do this, I'm wrapping cross over the hackle stem so that if a fish gets in there and hooks the hackle stem with its teeth, it's not going to break off the hackle and have it completely unwind. When I get behind the bead, one good solid wrap around behind the bead and wrap in behind and then in front. Now with really fine wire at this point, you'd be able to do what we call helicopter. You'd wiggle the wire around like that, but this wire is a little too heavy for that. So I have a pair of older scissors. I get in here and I go right Hold this, the wire forward. I go right down to the very base of the scissors, not at the tip, right down at the very base. And then just give them a little squeeze and that cuts the wire without damaging the point of your scissors. A little bit of wire that sticks out there. Wrap a little bit in behind here to cover that butt end of the wire and then whip finish. I can do this by hand. But for a beginner, one of the ways of getting around it is to use a tool like this. It's called a half hitch tool. And I just pull my thread towards me, wrap around the tool with the point up, and I put that over the eye of the hook and cinch it down. You can do that with your finger, but it's a little bit more problematic with the finger. It's hard to get that in the place. Or you can use the whip finisher, which is in some ways the easier way, as I can place those wraps precisely where I want them.
and trim off the thread. So there you are, there's a basic woolly bugger with a little glass bead as an attractor. And that's it. Comments and questions. Very nice, Dave. Both guys. Nice fly, Dave. Yeah. Thank you. Do you have a wrap behind the tail just to hold it up a bit? No, I don't. I, I want, I, I'd like the tail to be a little bit that fan shape. Mm -hmm. If I wrap behind, it'll stick up and I want it to spread out. Yep. Uh, it, it's I a think good it, fly for mixing colors too. Yeah, it is. Uh, yeah, I, I would. You know, you t you tie these in in a whole raft of different colors and and mixing colors, like you say, maybe a brighter tail or a, a, a darker tail. Uh, I I like the red bead. I think if you've talked to Dennis Southwick in Edmonton, he swears by the red bead. I think it I think it works. Particularly these little mirror beads. The, uh, you know, this is uh, this entire vial was uh, two dollars. <laughs> Lifetime supply of gold uh, of glass beads for two bucks. Was that from the bead store by Robinson's? Day? You betcha. That's precisely yeah. where it came from. <laughs> now, and 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 for those who, who are interested in using brushable super glue, I got this one at Home Hardware for six bucks. You can get them. You can get a similar product from uh, Canadian Tire. That's a Gorilla Glue that is a little more viscous, but it has a it has a yellow top. Here, I got it here. This is this is the Gorilla Glue version, and it I has. I like that one as much, Dave. I find it a bit too gooey. Yeah, it's it's really quite quite viscous, and you you do undo the bottom here. The nice thing about this one is that it doesn't glue itself to the top. So you just, you really have to squeeze some of the glue off and you get that little stringy bit. It's, it's not the most pleasant one to work with. But if you can't get the other one, this one works better than, than others. So, grow glue. So there we go. Now I'm gonna take the spotlight off me. Wherever I did that. I'm still learning this interface. <laughs> Remove spotlight. There we go. We're back. You're now. still recording. Yep, I'm still recording because Florin's going to go. Oh. Florin has some flies for us. <laughs> Florin has little time, so it's going to be Florin. Sorry about that. <laughs> Florin has a fly, not flies, just right. the one. Um, yeah. So this is a gray drake, and this is a this is a bit of a lesser known fly, and I guess people don't go as crazy over this one as they go over the over the green drake, but this seems to be a, a bug. So my interest in this fly uh, comes from the fact that. It is present in some interesting spots in Jasper National Park. Um, and in, 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 in the park, um, it seems to be uh, a fly that you want to fish on some of the lakes, uh, Medicine Lake, Beaver Lake, places like that. Um, and then I went and I did a little bit of a search. There's a, there's a ton of information in, um, like in specialized uh, bug books like the, uh, what's the one, the uh, mayflies title. I have somewhere, uh, did I put the reference in there? Um, a few things here, so I don't forget them. But anyway, these are some pictures I called from the internet. These are spinners. Um, you can see the characteristic is this, this banded dark and lighter gray for the body. And then the done shows a somewhat similar uh, characteristic. Okay. Uh, pictures of duns are pretty, pretty hard to, to find. And then there's some corresponding nymphs that I would like to present um, later on this year. So I'm just going to start with the, um, with the done pattern. 
which is basically just a large, um, just a large made fly. And to some extent, other than the specific colors and so on, the, the tying instructions here are, you know, pretty generic dry fly eyes. This is not a bad one to work with. And it has some, okay, I'm going to switch now to my vice. Yeah, your your audio is breaking up a little bit. For... My audio is breaking up because my internet connection has gone flaky. Ah, um, and there is very little, unfortunately, that I can uh, that I can do about that at this point. I'm just I'm just gonna have to hope that this is going to uh, start behaving in a moment or two. Okay, so you know, back to the uh, <laughs> discussion about hooks. Um, I went and I normally tie on on standard Mastad 90, 94, 840 hooks, but then I discovered these uh, these DMCOs uh, 101 hooks, which are ring guide uh, up eye hooks used to be available. And if you look at at some older fly tying books, there'll be a lot of talk about up eye hooks, um, but go to a fly shop today and you'll be you'll be hard pressed to find any. So the best, the closest thing you can do to an up eye hook is a, is a straight eye. So Tiemco makes this one. And you'll notice that this is a slightly longer shank. So if your fly is a bit more long and slender, this is, this is not a bad uh, alternative choice. And Daichi makes a couple of uh, ring guy hooks for dry flies. One is more cheaper, I think, if you buy it from the Canadian Lama by the hundred. And then they make a short shank hook as well. Maybe I should have shown you those uh, Canadian Lama. Where is it here? Oof. Where is it? Canadian Lama. Uh, I can't seem to find the, uh, oh no, not this one. Um, let's try this and let's try Canadian Llama here. So they make a short shank hook, which is very nice for some of these um, extended body flies. And the number on this one is 1640. And the one that's similar to the Tiemco is this one this so-called white white gape dry fly hook which is i think quite similar to the tmco 101 okay so these are two two alternative hooks that that might be interesting to tie on okay let's get on with a fly um so you know usual stuff hook in the vise um eight or thread like dave was using earlier in black build a little bit of a base now there are different schools of thought here you know tie your wings on first tie your, your wings on last end of the uh, at the end of the tying process rather than having to bump into the wings all the time. So you just sort through your mallard feathers and, and find some that have some nice barring on them and separate a small bunch of fibers and measure a little bit less than hook shank. Transfer to the other hand and secure with a couple of wraps. Okay. Now for the body, the body is going to be simply dubbed and is going to have a rib of some gray material. And what I'm using here is some of these Danville's uh, rayon floss. And specifically I'm using the, the recipe calls for iron blue dun. And I was talking to some of the guys in Edmonton and they were like, oh yeah. And you know, the only material is the one that you would buy at Denny's fly shop that closed like 20 years ago. 
um, I think this is a good substitute. Uh, and this is the uh, what Danville calls their charcoal color. And the corresponding number is 135. There are a few alternative materials here uh, that I, I went and I searched. Um, basic embroidery floss is a material that I routinely use whenever I need some color that's not exactly easy to find. Um, this nice dark gray is the 317 shade. And then also the uh, also DMC, so the same manufacturer of the embroidery floss makes these sparkly threads. And this is the one that they call um, a diamond thread and the code for the colors uh, 317. And this stuff comes um, comes from Michaels It's pretty, pretty standard stuff. Okay, so these are various um, colors that are available. And so what I do is because all I want with the floss is I just want a little bit of ribbing. I take one single strand, I don't want more because then I just add bulk and make an ugly fly. So I just take one strand of floss. And because I've only taken one strand, I'm going to take it, I'm just going to cut a piece and secure it here right at the point where I put in my my tails. So I'm going to hold on to this, just going to go back to the to the tying point for the tails. And for the for the abdomen and the thorax, I'm going to use um, gray muskrat under for dubbing. Um, anything in anything in gray, you know, if you have a synthetic of the right color, that's going to be just as fine. Um, yeah. Just dub your body. So dub the dub the thread. And don't overdo it. Remember, this is a it is a sizable mayfly, but it's still a mayfly. Okay. And go with the dubbing up to about the see there is a guard hair here, I just don't want that sticking out. And go to about the two third point on the body. And then before, so the next thing is going to put on the wings. But before I put on the wings, I want to put the rib on. So I'm just going to take this and if it's flattened out a little too much, I can always just give it a little bit of a twist. And if I use hackle pliers, I also get a little bit more control. And this step gives it that nice little banded look with a bit of shine, right? So if you want a bit more of a sparkly effect, you can, you can use the diamond thread that I showed you earlier, whatever. Okay, so trim this and put it aside. All right, I'm going to rip one more fly with this. And then for the wing, the original recipe calls for um, hen hackle tips, but uh, I find hen hackle tips to be both hard to come by and rather painful to work with. So instead, I have this wonderful uh, synthetic yarn that's sold under the label uh, like fly lawn. And this thing, if you take a whole strand out of the packet, it's a little too much. So what I do is I, I take my botkin and I gently separate the whole clump in roughly two equal parts. Okay, this one is a little bit more than one half of the, of the original bundle of fibers. 
I'm going to use this for size 10 flies. And then I have a just a little bit more slender bundle that I'm going to use for one size down. I'm going to get a lot of flies out of this one piece. And then what I do is I take a length of yarn that I'm going to actually fold up for the wing. So what I'm doing is going to be a little bit more than double the length of the wing. I can always trim the wing at the end. I get my my length of, of yarn here, and I'm just going to cut this off and set aside the remainder. And now all I have to do is tie this on to the hook. Now, there are various schools of thought as to how to do this. I find the following process fairly straightforward. So attach the bundle, just like that, and fold it up. And what I'm hoping to do here is make the splitting of the wing a little bit easier do a few wraps around the base as if you're posting this for a parachute okay and then this thing is still nicely separated and what you're going to do is you're going to make sure that it actually going to is going to go on the sides so do a couple of wraps like a figure eight basically a couple of wraps on one side and a couple of wraps on the other side and that's going to get your wing into position okay on either on either side if you find that this is a, still a little bit reluctant to to stay exactly the way you want it just go and post a little more on the base okay once you've got your wing standing up you're almost done have some prepared hackle ready to go sized and trimmed and what i do with all my my dry fly hackles is i just cut a little bit there at the tip so that the thread gets a better grip on the feather and doesn't slip out and another thing i was going to say because we when we refer to to feathers uh, we usually struggle we say convex, concave, colorful side, dull side. Um, and I was reading some book somewhere and somebody was suggesting, look, call it inside and outside. You know, when you put on a sweater, you always know which side is inside and which side is outside. And so with birds, the same thing, the feathers either have one side that faces outside and protects the bird from the elements and they have an inside side which stays close to the body of the bird and keeps them warm right so i'm going to take the outside of the feather which in this case is of course the shinier side and i'm going to secure this feather right behind so this is a little bit harder maybe to see it's going to go right behind the wing with the outside of the feather facing me. Okay, so once I secure it, I do also a couple of wraps in front. And then I'm going to add a little bit of dubbing again to the thread. To do a little bit of a, of a thorax for this for this fly. So not too much dubbing. You want to start the dubbing, you know, just a little bit also behind the wing. Now, of course, there, there are many things getting in the way, but, you know, just a little bit of dubbing behind the wing. And then go under and in front. And give yourself 
you know, at least an eye length to finish the fly off. And then grab the hackle pliers, and I'm using some rotating ones. And get your hackle wrapped. So start again, you start behind the uh, behind the wing. That's already twisted on me, okay? It's not, not a happy situation. You can sometimes convince the hackle to do your bidding. If you're persistent and you grab some of the some of the hackle fibers as you're trying to wrap. And if that fails, you just keep going because your fly is going to float. So do a couple of tight turns. So here you don't want to trap hackled fibers. That's your main concern at this point. Just go through here behind the wing, move the wing around if you have to. So leaving a little bit of leaving a little bit of the wing longer is going to help with this process. And stroking back is also going to help give you a cleaner eye. Once you've got enough hackle up here, which I think I have, just secure with a couple of turns of thread and slide in the scissors so that the base here can just cut the stem. Okay. And again, pull back on those hackle fibers. There's a little trick that one can use, which I haven't uh, endowed all my uh, or my bobbins with yet but what you can do is you can slip a little piece of tubing on the bobbin and use that to just push back on the uh, on the hackle but it won't be necessary now anymore okay and then just a couple of whip finishes because with especially with dry flies I'm is and actually not just with dry flies with names too I'm very very reluctant to use glues because if they get in anywhere they just you know your your hackle gets matted your wing gets matted on a nymph the fuzziness gets matted down as well so you kind of lose a lot of the lose a lot of the quality you need to have a very good and steady hand to use glue and i don't i don't quite feel confident enough to use glue and then all you need to do is of course, this wing is huge. Just go down and, you know, grab the wing fibers. Make sure that you're you're free from from the hackle, and cut it just a little bit above the hackle. And that's the fly. Okay, it's buggy, fuzzy. It's got good base of hackle here to float on. It's got some gray and some contrast in it. And you can tie these in 10s and 12s. So this is meant to be a big, a big fly. And if you do two whip finishes, um, it's a lot of fish before anything unravels. Questions, comments? <clears throat> Very nice, Florette. <clears throat> well done. Thank you. Good. So I'm gonna. Florin, what was the wing material? 